everybody. It's that time again. It's time for the Manalik's Dragons of Tarkir set review. Uh, we are starting with white. Uh, we're going to do Wooburg Order. So tomorrow will be blue and then black, red, green, and then uh, gold, artifacts, uh, colorless, and my just sort of general impressions and pre-release advice. Now, of course, the first thing we do with these set reviews is uh, some disclaimers. So disclaimer number one, I haven't played this set. I have not played with these cards. I have not proxied them often, tested them, or anything like that. Um, this is just me giving my personal opinion and advice on these cards based on my knowledge of the cards themselves. I've read them. I, I, I have seen what is going to be in this format. And, of course, we all know Fate Reforged and how it plays out. It's going to be a little bit different, of course, because you're going to be playing Dragon's Dragon's Fate. There's not going to be any cons, so those fake cards may change around a little bit. But that's disclaimer one. I haven't played the set. This is just sort of uh, basing my prior knowledge for the grades. The second disclaimer is these are my first impressions. These are how I'm going to be going into my first draft, how I'm going to be going to, into pre-release, uh, evaluating these cards. That means they're subject to change. As I play cards, I may find out that they're better than I thought or worse than I thought. As I see them played on the other side of the table, I may change my... Uh, uh, gradings for sure. But this is just sort of my first impressions to uh, get started in the format, how I'm going to uh, approach it, you know, next week at pre-release and the week after at launch day. Finally, the last disclaimer, these are my opinions, these are my grades, these are the ways that I approach magic. The way you approach magic, the way you grade cards may be different. Um, I definitely encourage discussion about this, of course. Uh, if I rate a card and you think it is horribly overrated or horribly underrated by me, uh, I would encourage you to think about why I graded it that way. Maybe you missed something. Maybe you didn't quite notice something. Uh, or bring it up with me. Maybe I missed something. Maybe I didn't figure something out. It's entirely possible. But yeah, these are just my, uh, my opinions, my first impressions of what the set looks like based on my knowledge of Magic as a whole and uh, the set previous to this that we'll still be playing with. So we're going to jump into white, and the very first card we have is Anafenza Kintree Spirit. This is Anna Fenza from Khan. She's uh, she's dead. She is now a spirit. She is white, white for a 2-2 legendary creature spirit soldier at rare. Her uh, rules text says, whenever another non-token creature enters the battlefield under your control, bolster one. So anytime anything other than a token comes into play, you're going to get to throw a plus one, plus one counter onto something, onto uh, something with the lowest toughness, of course. Now, bolster... I was famously a little bit harsh on in the Fate Reforged set review. I was uh, pretty happy with any bolster that was incidental and repeatable. Bolster for the sake of bolster, so a card that just says bolster 3, uh, cash defenses I believe is that card, I wasn't a big fan of. Um, and Offenza is repeatable incidental bolster. It's bolster on a 2-2. That bolster may make her a 3-3 or a 4-4, depending on what type of the, uh, uh, what point of the game it is and uh, what else you have on the battlefield. But it's repeatable. Every single time you put down a creature, a counter's going somewhere. And that's value. That, uh, that's fantastic. You know, the card seems pretty useful. It feels kind of similar to Herald of Anafenza, sort of, because you're throwing counters on things, making things bigger. Um, it, it's a weak comparison, but... Uh, uh, it's kind of what I thought of at first. Um, I also compare it to Herald of Anafenza because it's not a bomb. You know, this isn't, haha, I played this, the game's going to be over. It's a value engine. It's going to get bigger and bigger over time. It's going to do things. It's going to make other things bigger and bigger over time. So, you know, it, it's not going to be A+. plus. It's not going to be A. It's not going to be A-. minus. I'm going to give it a B, actually. 2-2 two -two is pretty weak. You know, that gets killed by almost every piece of removal in the set. Um, but hopefully it gets bigger just uh, by bolstering itself, even. Um, you know, it, it's something that I would include. It's something that would kind of put me into white. But you don't want to think that this is going to be just a game finisher. Uh, remember as well, it is non-token, so no shenanigans going on with uh, token producers or making a bunch of warrior tokens and getting a bunch of bolsters. That's not going to happen. But uh, just kind of a solid all-around value creature. Um, solid B for me. The next card we have is Erishin Foremost. Erishin Foremost is a one white white 2-2 two -two creature human warrior at rare. So it's a 2-2 two -two for three. Its rules text says double strike. 
And then it also says something else. It says whenever Erish and Foremost enters the battlefield or attacks, so the second it comes out plus every other turn that it attacks, another target warrior creature you control gains double strike until end of turn. So the warrior tribe is uh, alive and well in the new Tarkir. Um, I didn't see black white warriors nearly as much in fate cons cons i saw it an obnoxious amount in triple cons but it kind of faded away it was definitely still there and when i saw it it was good if it carries over into uh fate or dragon dragon fate this card's going to be an absolute awesome bomb in it um you know, this uh, compares pretty commonly to Silverblade Paladin. Silverblade Paladin was the exact same casting cost for a 2-2, but when it came into play, it soul bonded. And if it was bonded with another creature, it got double strike, and the bonded creature got double strike. This double strike isn't going to happen quite as often. You know, you don't get to put it on whatever you want. It has to be on a warrior, and it's only going to be when they're attacking, so you're not going to get to... Uh, uh, you know, block with this double striker or your other double striker. But uh, in the aggressive warriors deck, this seems really, really good. I don't know if that deck truly exists or not, but if it does, this is going to be a huge, huge, huge card to start with. You're going to take this and you're going to try to force that uh, warriors deck. Um, I give it a B plus. It's uh, you know, it's, it's kind of like Anafenza. It's not a bomb because it doesn't just do stuff by itself. You need some other stuff. You need some work put into it, um, but it will get you there. It'll do a lot of work. Um, so yeah, I, I'm pretty happy with this. B+, plus. I, I would probably first pick it, and I would probably try to force a, a warrior tribal deck with it. Next up, we have Artful Maneuver. This is one white for an instant at common. It says, target creature gets plus two, plus two until end of turn. So it's a it's a weaker and more expensive giant growth, but there's something else to it. We have uh, Rebound on this. This is our first experience with Rebound uh, in this set anyways. Uh, rebound was originally from World Awake, and Rebound says, if you cast this spell from your hand, exile it as it resolves. So it happens, and then it goes away instead of going to the graveyard. At the beginning of your next upkeep, you may cast this card from exile without paying its mana cost. So you get to play this spell again for free the very next turn. So Rebound uh, is really good. It's, a, it's the highest value mechanic there is, really. Uh, it's just fantastic to get this spell a second time around. And that's why it costs one more than Giant Growth, and that's why it does plus one, plus one less than Giant Growth. So plus two, plus two to target creature until end of turn. That's okay. 2-2 two, two isn't the best. You know, we live in a world of plus 3, plus 3 being kind of the the de facto buff, the de facto combat trick, giant growth, awaken the bear, etc. So plus 2, plus 2 is just a little bit weaker. We're in white, which doesn't necessarily get the biggest of buffs, so 2-2 two, two kind of makes sense with it. Um, my biggest issue with this card is that there's really no guarantee that it's going to do anything worthwhile the second time around. You know, maybe you buff your creature and it just dies in combat still. Or maybe your opponent removes the creature. Or maybe by the time the next turn comes around, plus two, plus two does not make a profitable attack. And so you're just going to have this plus two, plus two spell that you could cast again, but there isn't really a point of doing it. Um, combos, obviously, with the uh, prowess from Fate and the kind of fake prowess that we'll see on some uh, white and blue cards later on. Um, but honestly, it just seems not the best to me. This feels similar to Defiant Strike, which is a card that was totally okay, but extraordinarily cuttable. And I almost always cut Defiant Strike. It was very rare that I actually played with that card. And I feel like Artful Maneuver might be the same. I could be undervaluing the rebound on it. Maybe it's just going to, a huge amount of the time, be actually super useful to rebound it. But... My kind of first impression is I don't think so. So I give it a C-. minus. I think it's uh, pretty darn cuttable. There's probably better uh, combat tricks that you want to play, or maybe just another creature in your deck. Next up is Aven Sunstriker. This is a 1-white-white-1-1 one white, one one creature bird warrior at on common. So a 3-mana 1-1, one one, not the best. It has flying, still not the best. It has double strike, 
We'll talk about double, double Strike in a second. And it also has Megamorph. Megamorph is the new mechanic for uh, Dragons of Tarkir, the new face-down mechanic. Megamorph says you may cast this card face down as a 2-2 creature for 3 colorless. Turn it, up, turn it face up at any time for its Megamorph cost and put a plus 1, plus 1 counter on it. So this is Morph with the little tiny added benefit that you get a plus 1, plus 1 counter when you turn it face up. We'll talk about Megamorph a lot. It's on an awful lot of cards in this set. It's, it's probably about as uh, often occurring as Morph was. Um, but it's going to cost more, of course, because you have to pay for that plus one, plus one counter. So what do I think of this card? Well, I certainly don't terribly care for it. Um, a one, one double strike is bad. Really, 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 really bad. Um, double strike is, in my opinion, very overvalued by people. Uh, we'll talk about this a little bit later on some other cards, but, uh, double strike isn't the best. It can be super useful, but it's not awesome just thrown on any creature, and thrown on a 1-1 one, one is just bad. So you're obviously going to want to be uh, you know, throwing this down as a morph and megamorphing it, which means that we're looking at a 5-mana 2-2 two, two double strike flyer. So virtually, if we're not talking about removal or anything, uh, a 4-4 four, four flyer. For, 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 for five, plus you have to pay it for three, and it has to live until turn five, blah, blah, blah. That just seems bad to me. Um, there's some Megamorph I like. Not all the Megamorph is grossly overcosted like this, but I just don't like this. I don't like waiting this long to get such a, a low-impact creature. On turn five, your opponent might have dragons out, and this doesn't really tussle with dragons all that well. Um, so yeah, I don't like this card. I'll be slightly cautious and give it a C minus, but I think I'm going to cut this probably a lot more often than a C minus. Um, yeah, C minus, beware of that. Not a big fan. Next up, we have another Avon, Avon Tactician. This is a creature bird soldier for four and a white at common, and it's a 2 3. And it has flying, of course, as all Avon do. And it says when Avon Tactician enters the battlefield, bolster one. So we had a four white creature that bolstered when it entered the battlefield in the last set, and it was and it was called Elite Scale Guard, and it was probably the best on common in the set, uh, tied with or at least pretty darn close to Teamer Sabretooth. It was awesome. This guy is a four white bolster one. Elite Scale Guard was bolster two, and Elite Scale Guard had an awesome ability on it that uh, made anybody with a counter become a tapper when it attacked. This guy's ability is flying. <laughs> Just not a big fan of this guy at all. Um, you know, maybe he's going to be a 3-4 flyer for 5. That's still not all that good. You know, that's that, that's just pretty pretty bad in my in my books, I think. Um, not a big fan of this guy. Not a big fan of Bolster 1. Uh, Bolster 1 needs to come with something that I really want to play anyways. Uh, a 2-3 flyer for 5 just isn't really that. So he gets a C- minus as well. Again, I think I'm going to be cutting this guy pretty regularly and uh, not taking him all that highly. Next up, we have a reprint. This is Battle Mastery. It was last printed in M15, I believe. Um, it's an enchantment aura for two and a white at on common, and it says enchant creature, of course. And it says enchanted creature has double strike. So I said we were going to talk about double strike. I already alluded to my rant about double strike, and that's that I don't value it all that highly. A lot of players love Double Strike. They think it is just amazing. Um, and I don't. Uh, I was wrong on Teamer Battle Mastery for sure. Teamer, ba Teamer Battle Mastery was much better than I uh, gave it credit for in the original set review. Um, but Battle Mastery, I just don't like. Teamer Battle, uh, or sorry, yeah, Battle Mastery. Teamer Battle Mastery. Was it called Teamer Battle Mastery? Teamer whatever it was. Teamer Battle Rage, sorry. Um, it was significantly better because it was A, two mana, not three, and B, it was instant speed, so it was a surprise. You could throw it on the one unblocked creature that got through and get in for a bunch of damage. This, you have to play on a creature at sorcery speed. Your opponent knows exactly what's going to be happening. So, yeah, I don't like it. It opens you up for a two for one. It is you know blatantly telling your opponent what's going on and what's going to be happening 
it was pretty darn bad in M15, and I think it's going to be just as bad here. Uh, so I give it a D minus. Probably should just uh, be confident and give it an F. I will not be playing this card ever. Next up, we have Center Soul. Center Soul is one in a white for an instant at common, and it says target creature you control gains protection from the color of your choice until end of turn. Rebound. So it comes back. So, uh, you know, this is always a good combat trick. This is always a good uh, uh, ability. Pr protection from color of your choice for one and a white is totally fine. We had Feet of Resistance, and it was amazing. Now it gave your creature a counter, which was really, really, really good. This doesn't give your creature a counter, but it does give you a second shot at protection. Now, similar to Artful Maneuver, I'm not 100% certain on how useful the rebound's going to be on this. You know, you're you're ninety nine percent of the time going to be playing this spell to counter uh, a piece of removal. Somebody's going to be playing uh, Reach of Shadows, and you say, "Nope, pro black." The question is, next turn, what are you going to do? It has to be during your upkeep, so you have to guess what removal might be played, and more importantly than that, your opponent can just respond with the removal in response to this spell being rebounded, and so you won't even get to protect protect from it. So the rebound is really going to be used, I assume, to get through some damage on a mono-colored board. So if your opponent only has green creatures out, or let's say black creatures, they play it out of Reach of Shadows, you protect your creature from Reach of Shadows next turn around, they're only playing black creatures on the battlefield right now, so you give it pro-black again, and you get to swing in for some damage. And that's kind of cool, but I don't know how often that's going to pay off, because of course a lot of people are going to be playing two colors. Some people, and I think it's going to be a massive mistake, are still pretty big on the idea of playing three colors. So you're going to be facing a board where you may just not be able to pick a color and get through for damage. So I don't know how much that rebound's going to pay off. Uh, I'm a bit cautious on rebound of spells that uh, are very situational like this one. That being said, the spell itself is just pretty good. You know, I liked God's Willing. Now it was cheaper and gave Scry. I liked Feet of Resistance, it gave a counter, but I'm still totally fine playing this spell even without those little uh, bonuses tacked onto them. So I give this a C+. It's not a, it's not a high pick, it's not as high of a pick as Feet was or God's Willing, but I think it's probably playable in most of your white decks. So I do give this a C+, uh, and I'm definitely interested to see how often the rebound uh, does anything. Next up is Champion of Erishin. This is a 3 white 3-2 Creature Hound Warrior at Common. It has Lifelink. And that's it. That's the end of its rules text. It is just a Lifelinker 3-2 for 4. 4-mana uh, four 3-2 Lifelinker. Totally okay. You know, it's slightly too expensive to be in the, uh, uh, the full-on aggro deck that it would probably want to be in. Uh, at 4-mana, the full-on aggro deck wants uh, arguably something that's a uh, you know, a bit more powerful than this. Um, but, you know, it's kind of a fine include, I think. It's a, not a high pick at all. It's not a, uh, an instant include, uh, but it's probably more includable than it is cuttable, I would think. Um, the two toughness hurts a little tiny bit, though. Um, but overall, I think it's just kind of okay. Just a, a solid C, I think. Uh, I'll play this sometimes. I'll cut it other times. That's really all about all there is to say about it, I think. Uh, other than that, the only other thing to note is it is a warrior. Um, you know, so there could be shenanigans with a lifelink warrior uh, just naturally. Following that up, we have another warrior. This is Dragon Hunter. Dragon Hunter is a 2 1 for 1 creature human warrior at Uncommon. Uh, 2 1 for 1s are fine they are always pretty decent in white uh, white is known for these cards and back in the day it used to be you would pay one white for a 2-1 vanilla nowadays you appear to be paying one white for 2-1 with something and dragon hunter has something dragon hunter has protection from dragons of course and also dragon hunter can block dragons as though it had reach so this guy is a 2-1 that you play on turn one Turn 2, turn 3, turn 4, he's probably going to be attacking in, getting in some damage. And then he can hang back and just sort of, you know, not even care about those dragons on the other side of the battlefield. Because if they attack, this, this guy's just going to swat them away. He's probably not going to kill them. 
unless you bolster him or something, but he can just smack him down, and you know you don't really care about anything. Uh, this card essentially says protection from bombs for arguably the most part of this set specifically. Um, I'm all in for taking this guy pretty heavily. Uh, I give him a B minus. I think he's, I think he's solid. Obviously not remotely a bomb, but just a solid utility guy, uh, especially in this set. And uh, disregarding the rules text, a solid aggro creature for uh, kind of a white weenie deck. So solid B- minus for me. Next up, we have Dragon's Eye Sentry. Dragon's Eye Sentry is another one drop. It is one white mana for a 1-3 creature human monk at common. And it says Defender, First Strike. Very strange uh, abilities to be throwing on this. Uh, a 1-3 doesn't necessarily usually get first strike or need first strike, uh, especially so when it has Defender on it. Um, now, we'll talk about this much later on in the green set review, but there's the potential for a Toughness Matters deck. Specifically, creatures are going to be using Toughness as their uh, uh, combat dam damage number. And in that deck, with that specific rare that we'll talk about, this would actually be uh, essentially a 3-3 first striker. Now we'll talk about that rare when we get to it, and we'll talk about whether or not this deck exists. Well, it exists, of course, but whether or not it's doable. Um, but just as is, I think this is awful. You know, I, I didn't like playing Jeskai's Student, and it had Prowess and could attack. This is just a 1-3 with Defender, with First Strike. I don't think I want to take this almost ever. If that uh, Toughness deck actually works, maybe this is a card that goes into it. And maybe it works because this is a card nobody else wants. Who knows? Um, but just sort of in the grand scheme of things, this card's bad. I don't want to pick this or play this at all unless I'm trying for that toughness deck. So, uh, you know, I give this a D plus because maybe that toughness deck works. But uh, in all other cases, this should just be a flat-out F. Next up, we have Dromoka Captain. Dromoka Captain is a 2-white, 1-1 one, one creature human soldier at on common. Dromoka Captain says, first strike. So it's a 1-1 one, one first strike for 3. Not the best. But it also says whenever Dromoka Captain attacks, bolster 1. That means that this card is virtually a 2-2. Two -two. Because when you attack with this, you're going to be bolstering itself. Unless you have another X1 and you decide to bolster it instead. So it's basically a 2-2 two -two first strike for 3. That makes other things bigger as you go. Now as we said, uh, you know, I like incidental bolster and I like repeatable bolster this is repeatable bolster on a body for sure it's basically baby Dromoka you know Dromoka was whenever it attacks bolster 2 technically whenever a dragon attacked uh, this is whenever it attacks bolster 1 so it's little baby Dromoka um, I think this guy's totally fine um, you know a 1-1 one, one for 3 is expensive but when you think of it uh, technically being a 2-2 two, two for 3 it gets a bit better and that uh, repeatable bolster is just great this has a, a fantastic place in an aggro deck um, I'd be pretty happy to take this fairly highly and uh, include it in basically every deck that I play. Thank goodness it's not a warrior, but uh, still pretty darn good. I give it a B-. Next up we have Dromoka Dunecaster. Dromoka Dunecaster is another one drop in white. It's an O2 creature human wizard. For one and a white, you can tap it and tap target creature without flying. Now, if you haven't played with tappers, I don't remember that many in recent times, or at least playable ones. Uh, tappers have historically been very good. Uh, Abyssinian Priest is one of the first ones that I played with, and it was amazing in, in a Strad draft. Um, this one, unfortunately, isn't quite there. It isn't quite at that level, and the issue is that you can't tap things that are flyers. And as we all know, this is Dragons of Tarkir. Uh, the big, balmy creatures are generally going to have flying. So this unfortunately kind of says, tap target creature that isn't a bomb. And tappers are good because they can tap bombs. Now, this is something I really need to see how this format plays out. While the bombs are these big flying dragons, I don't think dragons are going to be as prevalent as people expect in Limited. We'll get to the uncommon dragons pretty shortly, at least the white ones. And uh, a bit of a spoiler alert, I'm not a big fan. 
So while there are a lot of dragons in this set, absolutely, there's something like 30 or some odd dragons, the majority of the playable ones are at rare or mythic rare. And so that makes me think that in draft, in sealed, you're not going to see that many dragons. And if you do, they're not going to be all that scary, as we'll talk about some of these uncommon dragons in a little bit. So I don't think this is as bad as it could be if dragons were more prevalent than I think they will be. But it does still miss those big bombs. So, you know, I have to give this sort of a, a downgrade. I give it a B minus. A lot of tappers would get an A from me, but this one gets a B minus. Uh, but this is definitely a swingy grade. It could go higher, it could go lower, and uh, I'll, I'll kind of have to see how it plays out. And you'll hear that with a few cards. There are a few cards that I just can't quite get a grasp on until I play them or until I see somebody play them. But this guy gets a B minus. Tappers are usually pretty good. Um, this one misses some stuff, but I think it still should be fairly okay. Next up is Dramoka Warrior. Dramoka Warrior is a 1 and a white 3-1 creature human warrior at common, and its rules text says nothing. Nothing at all. It's a vanilla 3-1 for 2. It is an Oresco Swift Claw, which uh, I love. I love 3-1s for 2 in white. They're one of my favorite stat combinations. Uh, I regularly played Wandering Champion as a vanilla 3-1. I played Wandering Champion in Abzan decks. I played Wandering Champion in you know, black-white decks. I played it in all kinds of decks. I don't know if I ever actually used the ability on it. I'm just happy to see a 3-1 for 2 in white. It's a great stat combination. It is an awesome in white aggro. Um, this has the added benefit of being a warrior, which means that maybe some shenanigans could happen with it. Maybe it could gain vigilance, as we'll see a little bit later. Maybe it could uh, uh, gain some other stuff. I think this is a great pickup. B-... minus. Um, you know, it's not first pickable, but it's pretty highly pickable and uh, generally totally includable in your white deck if you're in any way aggressive. Next up, we have Echoes of the Kin Tree. Echoes of the Kin Tree is one and a white for an enchantment at Uncommon, and it says pay two and a white, bolster one. So we've talked about bolster. We talked about Bolster a lot in the Fate Reforged set review. We've talked about it a little bit here, and I've said over and over, I like Incidental Bolster, meaning I like Bolster that comes with other stuff, and I like Repeatable Bolster. Well, this is not Incidental Bolster. This card is bolstering for the sake of bolstering, but it is Repeatable Bolster. You can do it over and over and over and over. So do I like Repeatable Non-Incidental booster Bolster? And I don't think I do. You know, I, I don't think I see myself liking or caring about this card. Um, you know, you have to put it in your deck, which means it's going to take the place of a creature or a non-creature spell that probably would be better. You have to play it out. It has to sit there. And then you have to sink mana in it to get a plus one, plus one counter for each activation. And I don't think that's all that good. In my first five or six turns, I want to be slamming stuff down on the board. I want to be establishing my board presence. In a lot of decks, I want to be attempting to wrap up the game by turn six, turn seven, turn eight. Um, and this just doesn't get me there. You know, this is for a long, long, grindy deck that's going to go to turn 15, 16, 17. Uh, and that's just not the decks I want to play, and that's not the kind of decks that generally do that well. Um, I could be wrong on this, uh, but I don't think so. I'm going to give it a very, very tentative D+, plus, but I feel like it could very easily just be a flat-out F. Um, I'm not going to play this. I'm not going to pick this. I'll let somebody else do it, um, but I'm pretty sure it's going to turn out pretty bad. Kind of like Brave the Sands. I know some people were pretty big on Brave the Sands. Everything gets vigilance, vigilance and you can, you know, block extra things, but it was just awful. And I think this is uh, kind of up there. But anyways, moving on, we have Enduring Victory. Enduring Victory is four and a white for an instant at common, and it says destroy target attacking or blocking creature bolster one. So we've got some inc incidental bolster, and we have incidental bolster on removal. You know, removal's removal. It, it's good, and it's generally pretty expensive these days. Um, now, this is basically Sandblast, or more accurately, I guess, uh, um, 
Divine Verdict, I think. Attacking or blocking creature. Yeah, so, you know, it's pretty good removal, but it's so much more expensive than we're used to paying for it. Five is an awful lot to tack on just to get a counter out of it. And I'm not sold on that. You know, I'd much rather have a Sandblast. Um, I know Kill Shot isn't in the format anymore, but Kill Shot or something like that. Uh, five mana is a lot for removal, especially in white. So I'm not 100% sold on this as being an auto-include, uh, you know, the kind of, hey, this is removal, it must be in my deck. Kind of like Right of the Serpent, right? The Serpent is removal. It's unconditional removal. I last picked it in my draft today. Um, you know, it, it's not good removal. It's not auto-include like removal used to be back in the old day. And I think this is one of those cases. I think this is a piece of removal that... You know, maybe you'll play if you really desperately need removal, but I think otherwise it's just too expensive. So I give it a C minus, meaning, you know, it's cuttable the majority of the time. I think um, I'm just not a big fan of this, and it's it really because of the cost. Um, you know, I, I don't think the uh, increased mana cost by at least two is worth getting a single plus one plus one counter. So C minus, very cuttable. Next up is uh, not Fate Reforged, it's Fate Forgotten. It is a two and a white instant at common, and it says exile target artifact or enchantment. And that's all. It is just pure sideboard material. You know, this is a card that you do not take highly, you do not main deck it. There is no reason in this format that you should be main decking enchantment or artifact removal. Not only that, it doesn't seem quite as good as Naturalize and Limited because there's not really many targets that need to be exiled. You know, this is great in other formats where you need to exile, uh, you know, a god that's indestructible. You can't just blow it up. But uh, in this format, I'm pretty sure every single enchantment and artifact is blow upable. So uh, I don't see the need to play this over Naturalize or. Uh, you know, something that's uh, that one mana cost cheaper. It's in white. White doesn't necessarily have that much uh, artifact or enchantment removal now that a race is going to be gone from the, from the uh, limited format. Um, but yeah, it, it's just your usual sideboard card. It's, you know, don't take it highly. Take it when there's nothing else for you and you happen to be in that color. And don't ever mainboard it. Bring it in if you happen to see a Citadel Siege or something bad like that. So solid D, the usual sideboard grade. Next up is Glaring Aegis. This is a one white enchantment aura at common, and it says enchant creature. When Glaring Aegis enters the battlefield, tap target creature and opponent controls. Enchanted creature gets plus one, plus three. So uh, this is two very separate abilities here. You get to buff your creature a little bit with a very defensive buff, plus one, plus three. And you also just happen to get to tap a guy down. Um, my guess is that this is also part of the Toughness Matters deck, um, but I just don't like this. You know, it, it's a cheap tap effect. It's one mana to tap a creature. But, you know, I like my tap spells to replace themselves, you know, like Pressure Point did, or I would like them to freeze the target, like Crippling Chill, where it taps and it doesn't on-tap for a turn. Um, this, you know, it's going to be sorcery speed, so you're going to be tapping a creature that's going to be immediately on-tapping next step. So you're going to be tapping that creature in order to attack this turn and nothing else and you're buffing your creature in a very defensive way plus one plus three is you know not the buff that i usually like to see uh on my cards uh even looking at the chiefs from cons the chief that buffed power was significantly better than the chief that buffed toughness so i don't re really like this card maybe it's part of the uh, toughness matters deck but even then i think it's a uh, probably not a card you want to put into that deck so i give it a i give it a d plus it's probably not playable i'm never going to play it for sure if you want to give it a shot go ahead but uh you do so against my uh my better warnings um n anyways next up we have gleam of authority this is a one in a white enchantment aura at rare so it's probably going to do something cool it says enchant creature. Enchanted creature gets plus one plus one for each plus one plus one counter on other creatures you control. So it's uh, uh, high sentinels of Erishan, basically. Also, enchanted creature has vigilance and has pay one white tap it, bolster one. So there's a lot going on in this card. Um, it's got repeatable bolster, 
and it's got incidental bolster. You get something other than just bolstering with this. So, uh, you know, I, I kind of like this card, I think. This is uh, kind of interesting. It's going to buff your creature, possibly right away and definitely over time. And it's going to make your other creatures bigger. And it gives your creature vigilance and a tap ability, which is awesome, because that means your creature can attack, do some damage, and then tap and bolster something. So I'm actually pretty pretty happy with this. Generally, I don't like auras. Auras, of course, open you up for two-for-ones, where uh, you know you spend mana making a creature, and then you spend mana suiting it up with a uh, an enchantment, and then your opponent says, bathe in Dragonfire. And all that work, two cards, a bunch of mana, just erased with a, a single little burn spell. So beware the dreaded two-for-one, but uh, I'm pretty interested in playing this. I'm going to at least once take it pretty highly. Uh, maybe not first pick. Maybe first pick, who knows. Uh, but I give it a B. It could go down, it could just be a bad aura, but I want to have some fun with this. High Sentinel's Varishin was pretty good, and this basically makes whatever you want into a High Sentinel's Varishin. So I give it a B. Very excited to play that card. Next up, we have Graceblade Artisan. Graceblade Artisan is a 2 and a white 2-3 creature human monk at Uncommon. And it says Graceblade Artisan gets plus 2, plus 2 for each aura attached to it. So you know what I just said about auras and being careful and being aware of 2-for-1s? This encourages you to be incredibly risky and build incredibly bad decks. Uh, is it worth it to jam a ton of auras into your deck just to fuel up this one creature? Probably not. I really doubt it. Um, this seems more like something for casual play, commander play, uh, a format where there are really high impact auras. Um, in this format, I just don't see it being worthwhile. You know, you're you're not going to have seven Gleam of Authorities in your deck. You're going to have one, maybe. And uh, then you're just going to be looking at glaring Aegises and other bad things like that. So I don't really think it's worth it to play this guy um, for that. It is a 2-3 for 3, which is pretty okay. That tussles with any morph on turn 3 for sure. Um, so I think it's includable. But I don't think the ability is something that I'm really going to be going out of my way to uh, uh, do anything about it. So I give it a C. I think it's totally playable just for the stats and the cost alone, uh, but I'm going to be ignoring that ability the vast majority of the time. Next up, we have Great Teacher's Decree. This is a three and a white sorcery at Oncommon, and it says creatures you control get plus two, plus one until end of turn and rebound. So this is the, uh, the plus two, plus one cycle that uh, happened kind of probably not a, technically a cycle. Uh, in Cons of Tarkir, we had Rush of Battle, where creatures you control get plus two, plus one, and warriors get lifelink. And then we had War Flare, where creatures you control get plus two, plus one, and they on tap. And now we get creatures you control get plus two, plus one. And then we get creatures you control get plus two, plus one again the next turn. Um, this seems fairly okay. It's kind of bad because it's a sorcery. So War Flare was really good. Because it had, uh, it was an instant, and so you could use it just as basically this card on the attack, but you could wait until the last possible moment. Uh, plus, you had blockers back, or you could use it on defense as kind of a, oh, your alpha striking. Well, surprise! All of my guys are untapped; they're bigger, and you know, get a really big blowout. So this does lose a little bit because of that sorcery speed, um, but I kind of like the fact that this has rebound. So I was a little bit iffy on the previous two rebound spells. This one I kind of like, because if you're in a position to just slap down a sorcery speed plus two plus one spell, you're probably in the aggro deck, and you're probably doing pretty well. Uh, you're going to know if you want this card in your deck. You're going to have a lot of low casting cost creatures to fill the board on turns one, two, three, four, five or so. And then you get to attack in with your creatures that are all now more resilient because they have plus one toughness, and they're going to hopefully kill some things or just do a whole lot of damage. And then you get to do the exact same thing next turn. Your opponent's going to know it's coming, so they're going to be doing their best to fill up with blockers. But there's nothing they can do to stop it, really. You know, they could counter the rebound technically. Uh, but, you know, you're going to get in for an awful lot of damage with this twice. So I'm pretty happy with this. I give it a C+. Plus. Um, which is about where combat tricks generally end up, the uh, the good, not great ones. And I think this is a good, not great one. 
Uh, I'm excited to see how it plays. It, it could be cuttable, but I, I like this rebound spell. I like having this ability twice for sure. Next up, we have Herald of Dromoka. Uh, Herald of Anafenza got a demotion in this time uh, timeline. Herald of Dromoka is a one and a white, two two at common creature human warrior. It has vigilance, and it says other warrior creatures you control also have vigilance. So we have a vigilance bear. It is a 2-2 Vigilance for 2. Totally fine. Uh, if Black-White Warriors is a thing, or maybe it's in a different color, who knows, maybe it's White-Green Warriors this time, but if there is a Warriors deck, uh, this deck or this card could be a fairly solid include. Now, just like Double Strike, I see a lot of players, especially newer players, really, really, really overvalue Vigilance. Vigilance is nice... But you don't really want to go out of your way to get it. You don't want to be paying a whole lot extra just to get Vigilance on a creature. Now, luckily here, you're not going out of your way. You would play a 2-2 two, two for 2 any day. The fact that it happens to have Vigilance as an extra is awesome, and the fact that all of your other random guys, your other random warriors, might get Vigilance. Or, sorry, they will get Vigilance if they're warriors. They, the random guys in your deck, if they have, they have to be warriors to get the ability. Um you know, makes it an even slightly better card. Uh, it's kind of nice because it's not requiring you to go all in warriors. You can take this card, you know, relatively highly for a common, and then try to go warriors and not get there and still have a totally solid card. So uh, I, I'm fairly happy with this card. I give it a C as is, a 2 2 Vigilance Bear. Totally fine, totally playable. Uh, if you end up in the Warriors deck, I would bump this up a little bit to a, a kind of a B minus. Again, Vigilance isn't the best thing in the world, but it's uh, it, it's okay since you're not paying anything extra at all, really, to uh, to get it in this case. So yeah, C or B minus could go either way depending on your deck. You'll know uh, uh, where to value this based on what you end up with in your pile. Next up, we have Hidden Dragon Slayer. Hidden Dragon Slayer is a one and a white two one. At rare, Creature Human Warrior. It has lifelink, and it has Megamorph, two and a white, and it says when Hidden Dragon Slayer is turned face up, destroy target creature with power four or greater on opponent controls. So we have a 2 1 lifelinker for two, or we have a 3 2 lifelinker for three and then three, and when it turns face up, it smites the monstrous. That seems awesome to me. That seems totally fine to me. Um, what I like about this guy the most is that it really sort of fits in every part of the game. If I really wanted to, I could have a 2-1 for 2 and be totally okay with it. If I really wanted to, I could have a 3-2 lifelinker for 3 and then 3 and not just use the ability at all or maybe you know pick off one little 4-4 four four thing or something. And I'd be totally happy with that. And then late game, you can just cast this guy morph on morph for six mana and have a 3-2 lifelinker and kill their gigantic bomb dragon. I like this guy. I think he fits in all parts of the game. You're probably ideally going to be using this for that six mana removal spell plus a 3-2 lifelinker left behind. Um, but I like this guy a lot. I, I would first pick this guy. Uh, I put him at an A-. minus. He's just outside bomb range because he can't be a bomb as a 2-1. He can't be a bomb as a 3-2. Uh, but he really seriously impacts the board by blowing up uh, uh, blowing up their big, gigantic creatures. So I give him an A-, minus. probably totally first pickable. Next up, we have Lightwalker. Lightwalker is a 1 and a white 2-1 creature human warrior at common. And it says Lightwalker has flying as long as it has a plus 1, plus 1 counter on it. So, as long as this is a 3-2, it's a flyer. And that seems interesting. Um, you know, you're going to need to get a counter on this guy somewhere somehow. So you're going to need to be drafting some bolster along with this guy. So it requires some setup, and cards that require setup often aren't quite as good as they could have been. Um, but, you know, he's a 2-1 for 2, which is okay. It's no 2-2 two, two for 2, but it's still okay. It's still playable. And if you can get Bolster, it makes it even better. So, you know, draft this probably after you have some Bolster effects, I would think. Um, you know, you have uh, uh, Herald, or not Herald, you have um, 
Dromoka Captain or things like that. And then you pick this up as just sort of a value flyer, and it would be totally fine. I give it a C plus. It's you know, it requires that setup, which doesn't make it the best in the world, and it's totally cuttable if you don't have enough bolster or any bolster, of course. Um, and at the same time, totally playable if you just need a filler creature. So, you know, it's kind of filler level C plus. It's got a little bit of a bonus grade because of the uh, the potential there. Next up, we have Misthoof Kieran. Misthoof Kieran is a two and a white two one creature Kieran at common. It has flying vigilance, so it's just like Alabaster Kieran, but it also has Megamorph for one and a white. So. Mist of Kieran's interesting. It's kind of okay. A 2-1 flyer for 3 is a little bit expensive. You know, we talked about Vigilance. It's fine but overrated, especially on a 2-1. You know, the big reason you would want Vigilance is so that you attack with a big guy and then have him back as a blocker. You're not really going to be holding back a 2-1 flyer as a blocker. Um, odds are I will be megamorphing this every single time. I will not be playing this as a 2-1 flyer for 3. I'll be playing this as a morph, and then on morphing it as a 3-2 flyer. Um, it's just overall sort of okay. You know, it's a... For me, it's a stereotypical C. It's, it's fine. You can play it and not feel too bad about it. There's other stuff you'd prefer to have over it, and sometimes you will just cut it. Um you know, kind of a, a last pick of your colors before it dries up kind of card. Um, not that exciting, unfortunately. Next up, we have Myth Realized. Myth Realized is an enchantment for one single white at rare. It says, whenever you cast a non-creature spell, put a lore counter on Myth Realized. Pay two and a white, put a lore counter on Myth Realized. Pay one white, sorry, a single white, not one colorless, just a single white. Until end of turn, Myth Realized becomes a monk avatar creature in addition to its other types and gains. This creature's power and toughness are equal to the number of lore counters on it. This is interesting. However, it seems very, very, very fiddly to me. Um, it feels like Scroll of the Masters made ever so slightly better in that you can sink mana into it and give it counters. Um, I see this being a little bit better in Constructed, I think. Uh, I talked about Prowess a lot uh, with Fate Reforged, and I'll talk about it again here. Uh, there is no Prowess, but this literally Prowess but not called Prowess ability is uh, on a lot of cards in this set. Um, the big issue with Prowess and Limited is you're running a creature deck. You're running a deck with ideally 15, 16 creatures in it, maybe even more. And that doesn't leave many places for uh, non-creature spells to be in there. And in any given game, you're not going to cast all of your non-creature spells. So I'm not a big fan of Prowess or Prowess-like abilities in this case. Um, but this gets around that complaint a little bit by having the pay three, put a lore counter on it anyways. That being said, that's still a fairly expensive uh, uh, cost for it, so I'm not a big fan of that. Um, you know, the Monk Avatar has no evasion of any sort. It doesn't have flying, it doesn't have trample, it doesn't have anything like that. So, you know, generally you're just going to be slamming it into your opponent's creatures each turn to try to get through, or you're going to be making a blocker or something about it. Um, I'm just not a big fan of this. It's too fiddly for me. I'd love to see somebody play it. I don't necessarily want to be that person. Uh, I give it a very cautious C+. It could be awesome, but I don't think so, and I'm going to need to see it be awesome before I really give it a try, I think. Uh, so yeah, C+, for me, it's it's something I would include if I had it, maybe, but uh, not a card I'm necessarily looking forward to, and something I, 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 don't, I don't necessarily want to be the person to test it. Next up, we have Ojutai Exemplars. This is a two-white-white creature-human-monk 4-4 at Mythic. So you're not going to see this too often. It says, whenever you cast a non-creature spell, choose one. Tap target creature. Or, Ojutai Exemplars gain first strike and lifelink until end of turn. Or, exile Ojutai Exemplars, then return it to the battlefield tapped under its own owner's control. Uh, so first off, a 4-4 for 4 Absolutely. 
totally fine. Um, you know, some evasion would be good on it, but 4-4 for four, 4, totally fine. Uh, the abilities are where it gets kind of interesting. Uh, you basically add tap target creature to any spell you want for free, uh, which is a totally solid ability. You know, um, I talked about, uh, what was the card? Ah, yes, uh, Glaring Aegis. I talked about how uh, tapping something without freezing it isn't that great unless it comes with something or replaces itself. In this case, you're throwing it on probably a pretty good non-creature spell that you've chosen to include in your deck anyways. Um, so, you know, I, I'm pretty happy with the tap target creature in this case. The first strike lifelink seems a little bit weaker, um, but it's still totally fine in combat. Uh, the big problem there, of course, is that you need to have a spell that you're willing to cast in combat. Um, but, you know, if you have a combat trick, adding on first strike and lifelink to it is probably pretty darn good. Uh, the exile one is interesting because it basically uh, makes all of your spells say this creature gains hexproof. Um, because, of course, the creature, or the uh, the exemplars will be exiled, the counter or the removal spell will be countered, it'll fizzle out because it doesn't have a target. Um, so, yeah, you know, I, I like all those abilities being added to my random non creature spells. Uh, this is one of those prowess cards, or, or not quite prowess cards, um, and I think it's a pretty good one compared to the rest. Uh, it doesn't require you to play a whole bunch of non creature spells, but it makes your non creature spells really, 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 really extra powerful. Um, so I'm pretty happy with this guy. Uh, based on the stats and cost alone, uh, the extra abilities make me like this guy. Um, yeah, solid A- minus for me. It's it's not quite a bomb, but uh, first pickable and auto-include in any white deck you play, I think. Next up, we have Orator of Odrutai. Orator of Odrutai is a 1 and a white 04 creature bird monk at Uncommon. And it says Defender, Flying. As an additional cost to cast Orator of Ojutai, you may reveal a dragon card from your hand. When Orator of Ojutai enters the battlefield, if you revealed a dragon card or controlled a dragon creature as you cast Orator of Ojutai, draw a card. So basically, when you cast this guy, you can say, Aha, look at this dragon in my hand, and then put it back into your hand. Or if you just happen to have a dragon on the battlefield, uh, this creature will draw you a card when it comes out. Now, an 04 that draws a car, an 04 defender that draws a card is, is fairly okay. That's Wall of Omens. Um, it, it's pretty okay. The fact that you have to have a dragon makes this a little bit less good. You have to be playing. You have to have drafted a dragon. You have to be playing that dragon, and you have to have that dragon in your hand or on the battlefield. Um, that hurts it a little bit. Uh, we'll talk about dragons as a whole and how I don't necessarily think they're going to be played. Uh, as much as people are expecting because the playable ones are rare. So I don't know how often you're going to get the card out of this. And an 04 defender with flying for two doesn't really fit in many decks or possibly is even really worth it without the draw card. Um, so I'm kind of iffy on this. The flying is nice, I guess. It lets you block the 3-3 three, three dragons if people are playing them, but... Uh, Otherwise, I'm not a big fan of this card. I give it a C-. Um, if dragons are played a lot more than I think and you can reliably draw a card off of this, it's going to be better. It's going to be C or C+. But uh, as is, as the way I see the format happening, at least to begin, I'm going to give it a C-. Next up is Pacifism. Pacifism is a reprint. Uh, it's been printed many, 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 many times. It is a one and a white enchantment aura at common. And it says enchant creature. Enchanted creature can't attack or block. Have you ever played with pacifism? Because if you haven't, you are going to now. This card is awesome. Take this card highly. First pick this card if there's not a bomb in your pack. This card is fantastic. It is premium, basically, removal. The creature sticks around. If it happens to have abilities, those abilities can still be activated. But otherwise, this is solid removal that creature will just be sitting on the board doing nothing for the rest of the game um, it answers almost anything it doesn't answer activated abilities it doesn't answer hex proof but otherwise it answers everything else this is a solid a for me this is first pickable material um, fantastic removal if you're in white you want this card and you'll be including it every single time you have it Next up is Profound Journey. Profound Journey is 5 white white sorcery at rare. 
it says return target permanent card from your graveyard to the battlefield rebound so you get to return a permanent which is kind of cool you could return a planeswalker you could return a land you could return an enchantment most likely you're going to return a creature now reanimation spells in limited tend to be not quite as good as people want them to be um, your graveyard is going to be full of kind of crappy stuff stuff that you're playing you're happy to play but bringing it back for seven mana isn't necessarily the best thing in the world. Fearsome Awakening's been pretty bad. Um, you know, Dutiful Return returns it to your hand, but is still probably not playable. I just don't think this card's going to have much impact on Limited. Um, hoping that you get two great reanimation targets in your graveyard probably isn't the best strategy. You'd prefer to just have them on the battlefield the first time around and have them stick. Um, this is too expensive for what it does, even though you get it twice. I just can't advise playing this card. I give it a flat out F. Um, seven mana, just way, way, way too much. All right, next up we have Radiant Purge. Radiant Purge is a one and a white instant at rare, and it says exile target multicolored creature or multicolored enchantment. Now, uh, spoiler alert, there are no multicolored enchantments in this set, so... You can just forget that. Um, but there are multicolored creatures. There's a whole bunch of multicolored dragons, and they're pretty darn balmy. Um, most of them, anyways. Uh, does that mean that you should play this card? Does that mean that you should highly draft this card? No. No, you should definitely not. Um, Fate Reforged has no multicolored permanents. At, uh, common or uncommon, anyways. They obviously have the five dragon lords before they were dragon lords. Um, but, you know, they're at rare. And in this set, the majority of the uh, the gold cards are at rare. There's only five on commons, and we'll get to whether or not they're playable um, when we get to the gold set review. Um, but I just don't think you're going to see that many gold targets for this. Uh, obviously, it's fantastic if they happen to drop a big, balmy dragon lord, and you have this easy, simple, little, cheap removal spell for it. But that does not make it main deckable. That does not make it first pickable. Uh, I don't like this card for limited. At least for this format, I do not like it. Cons of Tarkir was full of gold permanent. And this card would have been awesome there. But we're not in cons anymore. Cons has been erased. Uh, we are in a set where this card, I think, is... D-, minus. I think. Um, it's clearly a sideboard card. And I don't even know if it's a good sideboard card. Um, I prefer probably a whole lot of other sideboard cards over this. Um, it's rare, which I mean, I think that means people are going to take it a little bit highly, but I'm not. I'm going to take this late, late, late into the pack, ideally, if it's still around. Um, and even then, I'm probably not going to play it. So yeah, D- minus for me, I just I don't think it's that good. In another format, sure. In this one, no. Next up, we have Resupply. Resupply is a 5 and a white instant at common, and it says you gain 6 life, draw a card. Don't ever play this. Please, ever. <laughs> 6 life is not worth 6 mana. Uh, at 6 mana, gaining life, I want 50. I want 70 life if I'm going to be paying 6 mana. I don't want 6. 6 is a single turn of damage this late into the game. Um not even worth it to tack a card onto it. You get to draw a card, doesn't matter, does not make this worth six mana. Life gain for the sake of life gain is just flat out bad. Um, yeah, solid F, F minus even. Don't play this card ever. Uh, if you never played Feed the Clan, you did a, a, a good thing there, and this should go the same way as Feed the Clan. Next up is Sandcrafter Mage. Sandcrafter Mage is a two and a white 2-2 two, two, creature human wizard at common and it says when sandcrafter mage enters the battlefield bolster one so here we have incidental bolster i like incidental bolster as we said or at least i'm kind of okay with inc incidental bolster um and this is incidental bolster on a fairly decent body it's a 2-2 two, two for three which you know is slightly over costed but if it's the only thing on the battlefield it's a 3-3 three, three for three which is perfectly costed actually um this may hit a morph this may hit any other x2 
Uh, maybe you play that 3-1 on turn 2, and then you play this, and that 3-1 becomes a 4-2 on turn 3. Um, this has some uh, sizable upside, I think. It's, it's solid, solid, solid filler at the worst. And at the best, it's better than that. I'm going to give it a C+. Um, it's not a high pick at all, but it's a, a total definite include in uh, probably all your white decks. So I'm pretty happy with this guy. It's no Sandstep Outcast, but... Uh, it's still pretty darn solid, so I give it a C plus. Next up, we have Sandstorm Charger. This is a four and a white creature beast at common, and it's a three four, and it says Megamorph four white. So you can cast this for four and a white and get a three four, or you can morph it for three and then Megamorph it for three and a or four, sorry four and a white, the exact same cost as it ca put a cost as a cost to cast, um, and get a four five. You can get a Siege Rhino, basically. Um, seems totally okay. Slightly better than War Behemoth, I think, and I think this is kind of supposed to be the the future-shifted uh, War Behemoth. Um, you know, I'm never really considering casting this as a 3-4 for 5. I, I, I would never really want to do that. I'm looking at morphing this on turn 3 and then getting a 4-5 out of it on turn 5, and that seems totally just fine. It's vanilla, which is problematic. You know, it doesn't have trample. It doesn't have any sort of evasion. It doesn't have any abilities. It doesn't do anything. But it's a 4-5. And if you need a 4-5, this is a totally fine 4-5. This is just like when you would play Feral Crew Shock because it's a totally fine 5-4. Or the times that you would even play War Behemoth. I played War Behemoth a number of times. I was never happy about it. I was never excited by it. But I was totally fine with it. And this guy fits that role pretty well. Next up, we have Scale Blessing. Scale Blessing is a three and a white instant at on common, and it says bolster one, then put a plus one, plus one counter on each creature you control with a plus one, plus one counter on it. So this is almost Dragon Scale Boon without the on tap clause because your bolster target is going to be getting two counters. It's going to get the bolster counter, and it's going to get the uh, the second part of this ability counter. So that's pretty decent. It, it's two counters for four which, you know, we've played before with Dragon Scale Boon. But it has the potential upside of, if there is a counter deck in this format, potentially pumping up a lot of your creatures even higher. I don't know if the counter deck is going to work in this format. We don't have Outlast anymore, and Outlast was an awesome way to get counters on creatures. Bolster is a much less awesome way of getting counters on creatures. So... It remains to be seen how good this card could be. This card I have as a C, and that's assuming that you're generally getting two counters out of it, and sometimes getting a couple more. If the counter deck is a thing, this card's an awesome include in it, and it could be a C+, plus, B-, minus, something like that. But as it is, I think it's just sort of middle of the road, cuttable if you want to, includable if you want to, solid C. Next up, we have Secure the Wastes. Secure the Wastes is an X white instant at rare, and it says put X 1 1 white warrior creature tokens onto the battlefield. So I think this requires the warrior deck to be a thing. Um, X 1 1s that are going to get some abilities and some buffs and maybe be 2 2s or maybe be some other things with lifelink or vigilance or, or get some things when they attack, etc., would be pretty darn good. X 1 1s that are just 1 1s? Probably not the best. Um, it's at instant, which is kind of cool, because that means it could be a combat trick. So they swing in with a 5-5 five, five on the ground, thinking you have nothing. You make five 1-1 one, one warriors and kill it. That's kind of cool. It gets a bit of a bonus for that. Um, but in general, I don't think this is first pickable. And it may not even be includable if it's not in a warrior deck. So I give it a C+. Plus. I'm a bit cautious with that rating, though. If the Warrior deck is a thing, I think this gets a better rating. Uh, but I'm going with a C plus for now on my sort of first impression. Next up, we finally have one. We have Shield Hide Dragon. This is a five and a white creature dragon at Uncommon, and it's a 3-3. Three, three. It has Flying. It has Lifelink. It has Megamorph for five white white. And it says when Shield Hide Dragon is turned face up, put a plus one plus one counter on each other dragon creature you control. So this is a 3-3 three, three flying lifelink for six, or it's a 4-4 four, four flying lifelink for 
for 7. That's a lot of mana. We talked about this in Fate Reforged. I got some flack for this in Fate Reforged for saying that the 6-drop dragons were way too expensive to be in any way useful. And uh, I'm going to say I was kind of right on that. People really, really, really sort of realized that the 6-drop dragons in Fate weren't that good. They were playable if you desperately needed a 6-drop. But in general, they were pretty unplayable, something you didn't really want to include. They generally went fairly late in the drafts. And I think these are up there. I don't think these dragons are good. Six mana, three, three lifelink? I don't want it. I'm not paying six mana for a three, three lifelinker. Will I pay seven for a seven, or for a four, four lifelinker? Probably not, no. I don't want to wait around for seven mana. The multi-dragon counter thing is interesting. Every single one of these dragons, there's one of these in each color, has this clause. If you can build a dragon deck, this could be kind of cool. But I don't know that the dragon deck is actually going to be a thing. Um, because a lot of the dragons are like this one, where I don't think you should really be playing them. So the dragon deck is going to require going all in on a strategy that may just fall apart. So I'm down on these dragons, unfortunately. I give this guy a C-. I I don't think I want to play this guy. I don't think I want to play any of his friends. We'll talk about them each one by one as we get to them. But uh, yeah, I'm giving this a C-. Not, a, not an auspicious start to the dragons of Tarkir. Next up, we have Silk Wrap. Silk Wrap is a one and a white enchantment at Uncommon, and it says when Silk Wrap enters the battlefield, exile target creature with converted mana cost three or less an opponent controls until Silk Wrap leaves the battlefield. So this is sort of like a reverse uh, uh, suspension field or something like that, except this is caring about CMC, converted mana cost. It's not caring about toughness or anything. Um, Suspension Field was great because you got to get rid of the bombs late in the game. This card doesn't do that. It doesn't play all that well in the late game. This card you want to be playing pretty early to get rid of uh, uh, their smaller guys. You know, there's not that many bomby three drops that I want to be getting rid of. Maybe you can uh, get rid of Anafenza or, or something like that that's small but gets a lot of use out of it over time or something like that. The one thing that's really nice about this is that it does get morphs and manifests late in the game. So your opponent's playing Shield Hide Dragon, and they morph it down on turn 5. Turn 6, you draw this card. You can play it and get rid of what essentially is going to be a 7-drop for them for 2 mana, which is pretty nice. So this does get a bit of a bonus for the uh, ability to take out morphs and whatnot. So it can take out some big things. It just requires a sort of specific scenario. Um, that being said, I'm down on this because of the comparison to Suspension Field and things like that. But it compares favorably to Debilitating Injury. Debilitating Injury was generally a pretty okay pickup. And it only did minus two, minus two. It didn't take out bombs. It didn't destroy dragons. It took out morphs. It took out little guys early. And this does too. So I think it is okay. I actually give it a B minus. I think I'll take this relatively highly, and it's going to be some nice early game with removal with some potential to do some things in the late game, just like debilitating injury. It's not awesome. It's not premium. It's not going to solve the 8-8 uh, eight, eight Atarka on the other side of the battlefield problem. But it's going to do enough stuff to be useful and enough stuff to be pickable, I think. So I do give it a B-. minus. Next up, we have Strong Arm Monk. Strong Arm Monk is a four and a white, three three creature human monk at on common, and it says whenever you cast an on creature spell, which is just prowess. I wish they could say prowess. Uh, creatures you control get plus one plus one until end of turn. So cast a spell. Your entire team gets an anthem for the turn. This could be okay, but I'll repeat my concern for prowess. Limited's a creature heavy format. You're not going to be playing that many non-creature spells. The non-creature spells you are playing are going to be removal generally, which means preferably you're playing this on your opponent's turn. You're playing it after they've tapped out, after they've committed to something, at the end of their turn, etc. At which point you don't want your team getting plus one, plus one. That's not going to do anything at the end of their turn. Um, 
So, you know, you really want to be playing combat tricks to trigger this. Or you want to be playing your removal at suboptimal times. So I'm a little bit off on that, on just sort of the reality of this card, how it's going to work out in reality. In a vacuum, it sounds cool. But uh, I'm kind of down on it for how it will play out. Um, it's still a pretty powerful effect. And the 3-3 three, three body's fine. It does cost 5, so I'm kind of torn on this. Um, I'm going to go with a C+. Plus. It could turn out to be better than that, but I just don't know. I just don't like counting on prowess or fake prowess um, in limited because you can't really go all in on that format or else you're going to be way too short on creatures. So I give this a C+. Plus. Could be better, but I don't know. Next up, we have Student of Ojutai. Student of Ojutai is a 3-white, 2-4 creature human monk at common. And it says whenever you cast a non-creature spell, so fake prowess, you gain 2 life. Well, I I was okay with plus 1, plus 1 to your entire team. I'm not okay with gaining 2 life. 2 life is nothing. Um, you know, incidental life gain is okay. Getting life just for doing other stuff is fine. But it's still not the best thing in the world. So I don't really like this guy. I don't like the body either. 2-4 for 3, or 2-4 for 4 is not the best. Um, I just don't like this guy. I give him a C-. minus. I'm going to cut him pretty regularly. I'm definitely not going to be going out of my way to get the fake prowess trigger. Um, yeah, just not a fan. C-. minus. Next up, we have another dragon of Tarkir. We have Sunscorch Regent. This is part of a cycle as well. This is three white white for a 4-3 creature dragon at rare, and it has flying. And it says, whenever an opponent casts a spell, put a plus one plus one counter on Sunscorch Regent, and you gain one life. This seems really solid and balmy. It's a 4-3 flyer for five, which is fine. Right there, I'd play it. I wouldn't call it a bomb, but I'd play it. Beyond that, your opponent's going to cast spells. As long as the next spell they cast doesn't just kill the dragon, this dragon's a 5-4, and then it's a 6-5, and then it's a 7-6, and it goes crazy. Plus, you're gaining a little bit of life here and there. One life of spell, it's ultimately going to mean nothing, uh, except in the most extreme of cases. But what matters is this dragon's getting gigantic. Um, I really like this dragon. Um... So, you know, I talked about how I'm a little bit down on the dragons of Tarkir in Limited. That's the uncommon dragons. This rare dragon, I love it. I'm going to take it. I'm going to play it. I give it a solid A. But don't think that that means dragons are going to be running around. I'll talk more about this again uh, each day this week. But yeah, Sunscorch Regent, we'll talk about that right now. Solid A. Love it. First pickable. Auto include. Making me go white for sure. Next up, we have Surge of Righteousness. Surge of Righteousness is a one and a white instant at Uncommon, and it says destroy target black or red creature that's attacking or blocking. You gain two life. This is known as a color hoser. Um, these happen now and then. They're cards that explicitly hurt colors. Two colors, usually. Um, now, of course, this means that you need to be playing against those two colors. If I'm playing against a blue-green deck, Surge of Righteousness is a dead card. It's going to do absolutely nothing to me. So this is, of course, the ultimate sideboard card. This is a card that should never be highly picked. It should never be main decked. It should be a card that sits in your uh, sideboard, and you bring it in when you're going against a red-black deck. Against a red-black deck? This thing's awesome. It's Divine Verdict, plus two life randomly. Siding this in against a red X deck or a black X deck is a little bit worse. And I'd have to think a little bit more about if I want to actually put this in. It would depend on how heavy the red or black was in their deck. You know, if, if most of their creatures were in green and their bomb was in green, then I probably wouldn't side this in. But if their bomb was black and if they had a lot of good black creatures, yeah, I would side this in. And of course it comes in for sure against the black-red matchup. Um, but it's, you know, it's the prototypical sideboard card, which means it has to get just a flat-out D. All right, last up, we have Territorial Rock. This is a one and a white 1-3 creature bird at common, and it has flying, 
and that's all it has. So it's a flying Jeskai student without prowess. Not a fan of it. You know, uh, one and a white one threes just aren't what I want to do in white. Uh, white is not generally the color that you pair with control in limited in any ways. Of course, Esper control is a thing, and blue-white control is a thing in constructed formats. But in limited, white is typically the aggro color, and a 1-3 flyer is not aggressive at all. Uh, not a fan of this. It's just kind of bad. I'm never going to take this very highly. I'm probably never going to play it. Uh, like Jeskai Student, if I happen to be desperate for creatures for some reason i'll put it in but uh otherwise i just don't like this so i give this a d plus i don't give it an f because of that if i'm desperate i'll put it in kind of clause but uh yeah solid d plus so yeah that's white white has been wrapped up there are some good cards in white uh i'm pretty excited to play hidden dragon slayer and ojitai exemplars and uh for sure that dragon sunscorch regent there are some bad cards cards of course uh a fair number of sideboard only cards in my uh in my opinion anyways um but I, I i'm looking forward to white i think it could be pretty aggressive there's a lot of good two ones three ones for cheap um so i'm excited to see this paired with red i'm excited to see this paired with black and just uh get a lot of guys out early and just kill your opponent uh before they can even think about spending a bunch of mana on their uh they're mediocre dragons. But yeah, that's the wrap-up for white. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the set review. Uh, Blue will be coming tomorrow. If you have any questions or comments, suggestions, let me know. As I said in my disclaimer, definitely open for discussion. If you have uh, disagreements or or things that I've missed, uh, interactions that I didn't see, or or just blatant misreading the card, that happened before, um, you should should definitely let me know. As always, you should like the videos. Click that little thumbs-up icon to... uh, Uh, knock this up a notch to a like. Uh, You should also subscribe to my videos so that you can know immediately when the next set reviews come up. And of course, let me reach some more uh, uh, subscribers that way. Um, You can also find me on Twitter at TheManaLeak. That's L-E-E-K, like the vegetable, not the card. And you can also find me on Facebook.com slash TheManaLeak. And those links are in the show notes, of course. As always, if you have any questions, comments, suggestions, let me know. Otherwise, I will see you all tomorrow for the blue set review.